All right, good afternoon, good morning, whatever it is. Morning, so, so, for one more minute. Okay, I'm Jim Christie from the De Department of Defense Cyber Crime Center, and this is the uh, Meet the Fed, Meet the X-Fed, and Meet the TV Feds. So, so we're, we're changing up a little bit this year. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with uh, Spot the Lamer. Okay, you know, uh, they've been playing Spot the uh, Fed for years here, and we think it's only uh, uh, fair play to turn it around and, and pick the, the, uh, the some bitches out there that are lamers. So, Priest is gonna help us out, and he's gonna, uh, so just, when he picks you, come on up here, line up in front. Get him, Priest. Hey, any volunteers? Oh, we got one up here. God, we have a winner. <laughs> just, just stand right there. Great. Get some good looking women up here, priests. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. No. <laughs> Spot the lamer. Oh my God. <laughs> Need about two or three more. Okay, what we're gonna do while, while we find the last couple of the rules are, we're all gonna take a, a turn asking each of you a question. You guys answer the question and um, answer it loud enough over there, their speaker, the microphone's right over there. Answer the question, and then we're gonna have the audience vote who the lamer is, okay? You might win big prizes. A, a date with David McCallum. <laughs> this is a boyfriend-girlfriend team, by the way. Okay. Which, which is which? She's already throw, he's already thrown her on the bus. No, we're not. No, we're not, no, please. Would you like to ask the first question? I'm drawing blank. Okay. Okay, for, for the uh, husband and wife couple here. <laughs> uh, the question is, where do you store your porn? Ma'am, where do you store your porn? <laughs> ma'am, where, do where, where does he store his porn, ma'am? So what you're saying is you are his porn. Uh, I didn't hear. Did she answer? I I'm going to give myself one of these. <laughs> so where does she store her porn? It's actually in a shoebox under the bed. Oh, she's old school. Okay, David, would you like to ask a question? The microphone's right there. Um, oh. Who am I asking here? Pick one. Pick one. The gentleman right in front of me, right here. What websites do your neighbors frequently visit? Uh, Facebook, Gmail. Uh, <laughs> you got uh, a little Twitter action going on as well. And uh, there's a lot of gay porn, surprisingly. That might be my roommate. <laughs> <laughs> sure it's your roommate. Sure it's your roommate. You don't count, sir. Okay, Andy. I'll uh, ask my question to the lady in front of me. What's the worst computer virus you had this year? I didn't have any. My husband does the firewall. Oh, uh, that's a bullshit answer. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Leon. Yeah, I'd like to go back to the couple again. Uh, <laughs> have you ever flipped the dirty bit? There's no flipping. There's no flipping was the answer. John. All They're right, we'll Catholic, go to the guy sir. down the end here. Um, finish this sentence. The internet is for... Porn. <laughs> A very good question. I've got to go back to 
the first speaker. <laughs> the internet is for whatever we want to make it useful for. Do you work for International Import, sir? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, Justin. Do you. Have you ever had a lightsaber battle in public? <laughs> yes. Fantastic. <laughs> Dude, With like beer you. cans. You will have <laughs> Riley. All right, I'll go to this uh, gentleman right here. How much money did your mother give you towards your DEF CON registration? <laughs> It wasn't my mother, it was yours. Oh! <laughs> Holy shit. Rich, you got a question down there? Rich had a bad night. So. Uh, Rich, are you actually allowed to operate domestically? I had a great night. <laughs> he hooked up with a midget last night. <laughs> yeah, but jo Jim, can you explain the donkey? I get the midget. Actually, it and was the two girls with the donkey. Actually, actually, it was three midgets. They're very dear friends of mine. Uh, they're members. <laughs> they're members of the Little People of America. We're on Facebook. They're absolutely awesome. They're a hell of a lot of fun. Some of my best friends are midgets, sir. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Well, we're walking too far there, priest. Uh, I'll, I'll well, they no longer have don't ask, don't tell. So. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> Trust me, it doesn't. Maybe that's what she tells you. <laughs> All right, next dude. What are your plans for the first Saturday in May? Not that I'm asking for a date. Okay, he is, but I'm not. This guy? Yeah. Okay. The one who looks puzzled. <laughs> Sadly, I'm moving. Say again? I'm moving. Oh, big whoop. <laughs> okay, what we're going to do is you, need you, the audience to vote. You missed, you missed wait, one. Wait, you have at least one. Oh, oh. You, you missed the blonde. Okay, I'll you ask You asked for one. a blonde and you skip her. What's oh, going sorry. on? Does your wife know? Because she's here, I think. Did your last romantic relationship involve any human contact? <laughs> Barely. All right, we're going to vote. Couple number one. <laughs> All right, sit down. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We appreciate it. The blonde. You have been eliminated. You've been voted off the island. Thank I'm sorry. All right, this gentleman. Wow. Tough crowd. See you later. <laughs> this young lady. <laughs> oh, well, we're just going to keep you anyway. <laughs> This gentleman, raise your hand. Oh, oh your, your history is gone. You're gone. Okay, the next gentleman. All right, we'll let you stay because I'm sympathetic. Next, next gentleman, raise your hand. My question. Okay, sir, come on right down here. This gentleman here. All right, you're gone. <laughs> the old fart down the end. All right, all right. Okay, second round of questions, starting with this gentleman here. Uh, how old is your MySpace account? <laughs> okay. Okay, that's the next, the next question. Okay, David. Oh, wow. How much? Here he comes. Have you recompiled your kernel t yet today? 
I think I'm the wrong sex for that. <laughs> You're trying. No. <laughs> and it sounds so much dirtier with a British accent, too. <laughs> Andy. Okay, for when you go to for supplies at night, do you head to the kitchen or the nearest late night fast food place? That would assume that uh, my trip is for food, so neither. Hookers don't count, sir. <laughs> my drug dealer delivers. Okay. Follow one. Follow one. That's good. When you exit the gate of the base, is the laundry a Seven Eleven? And then, what is it, Madam Dragons? Somebody help me out, I can't remember what's over Lejeune. I have no idea. So when you exit the base gates, what, uh, what's the first shop on the, on the left? Uh, just outside eight, on H Street, right? Um, it's Madam, uh, yeah, Madam Dragon. You've been drinking today already? <laughs> See, we used to do Spot the Fed, but it's gotten so easy now <laughs> that we're not really doing it anymore. They're not very bright. So you ask him, you ask him leading questions like that. You can kind of see the wheels turning, and they say like something like that, which is it's a. Hold that thought. Okay, Leon. Last All question. Right. Which do you best relate to, bachelor frog, socially awkward penguin, or paranoid parrot? <laughs> I'm not sure I know what all those three are, but the, uh, the paranoid parrot, maybe, paranoid maybe that one's parrot. the one for me, because I'm good at repeating stuff, and yeah, actually the longer I've been in this business, the more a paranoid I become every day. Lamer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now we're going to do the final vote. Okay, contestant number one. <laughs> Contestant number two. All right, you're eliminated. Contestant number three. See ya. Contestant number four. I think we have a winner. Contestant number four. So if you'd step right up here, sir. Uh, we've got a couple prizes for you. We have the uh, Lamer t-shirt. Right? And uh, we have a uh, DOD Cybercrime Response Team t-shirt. And if you go down, uh, folks have uh, gifts for you. If you would... Uh, I have M&Ms for you. Because <laughs> I, I forgot my good stuff in the room. You know, the last time we had an Air Force hookup, the girl slept with him to get the fetcher. Hey, you're missing out on the, and, the best. And what you didn't, you got some what you didn't realize. You're missing out on the best one. This is a etched, old-fashioned drinking glass. You can drink beer in it, but I'm hoping that you're mature enough now to start drinking whiskey. I'm right on the whiskey. And the beauty of this cup is that it's from NSA, so you'll never lose it. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it in good health. Thank you very much. Uh, we also have a, an, a, a paid vacation for you. <laughs> Jim is so good. And have a nice fucking life. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Priest. Uh, now what we're going to do is we're just we're going the panel's going to introduce themselves to you and talk a little bit about what they do and then we're going to open it up to you folks for questions. So the microphone's up here if you want to start lining up for questions. David, my name is David McCallum and I do a television program called NCIS. Uh, and. I am extremely fortunate. Um, I just signed a new contract, and a couple of years from now, I shall be heading for my 80th birthday. So, what? when I hear, it, yeah, I think I think it's the genes as much as anything, and the care that my good wife Catherine here takes of me. But what is fascinating about my life is that whenever you act and do a job, you get a script, you get a part, and you learn the lines, you go along, you do it. 
But when it came to this particular show, I had never heard of NCIS, and I had never, I knew nothing about pathology. So you're looking at someone who has spent 10 years very much involved with the real NCIS. We've just in back, come back from Washington and been down there with them and um, been working with the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation and, and it's a whole new life that I have as a result of the show. And additionally, which is the fascinating part for me, uh, I have become obsessed with the world of pathology, having done full autopsy with Chris Rogers in, um, in Dan at Mission Street in California and witnessed many, many autopsies. And also, I've worked with Commander Malik, who's now Captain Malik, uh, the chief pathologist of the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. So my life is now divided into my life as an actor and my life as a crazy actor who just loves to do all this other stuff. And I have been exceptionally fortunate in doing that. And it gives me great pleasure to be here just to give something back from how much has been given to me. Thank you. My name is Andrew Freed. This is, I think, my 14th DEF CON. Uh, I'm retired. It's been a long time. I was much younger back then. Uh, I'm retired Internal Revenue Service slash Treasury. And since Ooh. I've been... Oh, everybody Ooh. loves us. It's TSA you're supposed to hate, not IRS. <laughs> <laughs> we hate those some bitches too. <laughs> IRS never approached you with rubber gloves on saying bend over. <laughs> <laughs> what a shitty thing to do. Anyway, uh, since I've retired, I have a company called DTEC. Those of you that are interested in uh, online sinkholes and research, I have a talk at 5 o'clock with Paul Vixie where we're going to talk a little bit about what we did with the DNS changer stuff. Uh, pretty much now, since I'm retired, I don't have to worry about most laws, or at least not the unimportant ones. So I'm pretty much an online vigilante uh, looking, doing a lot of research for spam trap, passive DNS, and, and some other, other stuff. My name is Leon Carroll, and I am a retired NCIS agent, and I currently work on the TV show NCIS. And I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I'm a six-year, was a six-year Marine officer, and then 23 years in the real NCIS. And there are a few NCIS agents out here in the audience. Pick out the Fed. And uh, my job on the show is to wave the bullshit flag. <laughs> I, I get to read all the scripts that come in, uh, 212, 213 now, over uh, nine seasons. and. Thank goodness, I don't get to wave the, sh the flag too often, but they do listen to me when I do. Uh, I know nothing about computers. My wife, Jackie, sitting down taking pictures right now, uh, does all my computer work, and uh, thank God for that. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Idonacy. Um, I'd like to first thank Jim Christie, Priest, and the rest of the DEF CON sponsors Jeff Moss for uh, giving us this opportunity to come here. I work at White Canvas Group. We sponsored the speaker party on the rooftop of the Rio. I hope some people were able to make it. Um, I spent most of my time in the military, uh, in the SEAL teams. Unfortunately, I tried to catch a bullet in 2007, which I don't advise. Um, I still won, but it was a, it was a long process. Uh, in the meantime, I kind of switched gears and began doing a lot of different uh, digital operations both for the special operations forces and for other government agencies. Uh, make no mistake about it, it if, if the government and or units that we work with um, is out to find you, they will. It's not a question of um, do you think it might happen, it's a question of it will happen and how much time and resources. So uh, we have some of the world's greatest and talented not just programmers but creative minds. I think at the end of the day, uh, creative minds can be used both for military purposes but also humanitarian purposes, education, and uh, just making the world a better place. So fortunate to be here and look forward to your questions. My name is Justin White. I currently work at the National White Collar Crime Center. 
We are actually a nonprofit organization that's actually paid for mostly by government grants. We have some grants from the DOJ and Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. My primary job is a instructor and trainer. I go ahead and I travel all across the country and we teach to state and local law enforcement, try to give them the basics in computer forensics. Uh, mostly a lot of the stuff I've done now has been focused more on the cell phones, which is fine, but I, I miss the computer stuff. I don't get to do it very much. And the downside with being an instructor is you end up spending so much time teaching the basic stuff, you start to forget all the cool crap you learned, uh, which is why I've been coming to DEF CON for the last few years to at least remind myself that you know, I don't have to just remind everybody what a zero and a one is. <laughs> Uh, before that, I was in the Army for five years as a counterintelligence agent. That's the only time I actually had any kind of investigative authority at all. And because the Army is the Army, I only actually spent about two years doing the actual counterintel stuff, which is where I learned all the computer forensics, well, beginning of my computer forensics stuff. Before that, you know, if you have the word intelligence anywhere in your job description, that's what they thought you did. So in Korea, I handed out security clearances. In Iraq, I just read a bunch of reports. Right. I think that's about it. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Riley Repko, and I'd also like to thank Jim and all the staff here at DEF CON. Um, I recently left the Department of the Air Force, the operations side of the house. Um, I got brought in from the private sector. Uh, so when people ask me what it was like working at the Pentagon, I usually tell them what an opportunity to serve at some of the finest 18th century mines around. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. My, my focus is all about leveraging you all, the wizards. Uh, what I did for the vice chief was to build a bridge between the seeker, us that have a requirement, and the solver, all of you out there. Sounds trivial, but uh, when you deal with a lot of parochial silos, uh, it gets pretty challenging. But uh, I left government. I'm now at Virginia Tech as a research fellow, and I'm also building that box. So I'm all about, again, connecting and delighted to be here, and thank you very much. Hi, I'm Rich Marshall, and I, I want to be Jim when I grow up. That guy is just absolutely <laughs> phenomenal, and there's some serious questions as to whether I ever will. I've had a checkered past. I'm the only lawyer on the panel. I specialize in information warfare law, so that makes me kind of a unique individual in some people's minds. How many of you have heard of Eligible Receiver 97? You know, the scary thing is the number of hands that come up when I ask that question at DEF CON gets smaller every year, and it shouldn't. Every one of you need to go back and Google Eligible Receiver 97, and here's why. I was a legal architect and led the red team for Eligible Receiver 97, and the issue was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at that time did not think information warfare was real. It was only a laboratory experiment. And the idea of moving ones and zeros across the world to do good and bad was just not intellectually or electronically possible. So they wanted to have an exercise to demonstrate that it was, okay? We downloaded techniques from the internet, studied them very carefully in the laboratory so that we would not have any unexpected consequences. And we used those techniques, many of which had been developed by DEF CON graduates, <laughs> uh, vulnerability researchers. I hate the word hackers. I always encourage people to use the word vulnerability researchers because that's really what you're doing. We used those techniques and brought down a war fighting sink in a matter of hours. Now, we had to do an awful lot of reconnaissance ahead of time. The importance of that exercise was that it demonstrated to the senior military leadership in our government and to our top political leadership, Bill Clinton at the time, that information warfare was real. Computer security needed to have a top spot at the managed, senior management level. Now, my transition point how many of you are CEOs out here? <laughs> yeah, not that many, but a few. Go back and tell your CEO how important it is to have computer security, to protect the intellectual property, to protect your business operations. Most of the time when you use the word security, they think of guns, gates, guards, and money that they never recover. They don't get a return on investment. 
But if the CEO does not do his job or her job correctly in terms of protecting their assets, they will get an ROI. It's called risk of indictment rather than return on investment. So that's message number one. Message number two, and I'm very, very proud of this, is I encouraged an Air Force colleague of mine who led a very special Air Force team to come out to DEF CON, wear his uniform, get on a panel, and recruit from the audience. He did. He's now at Microsoft, but his legacy lives. Of the 67 people he recruited over two years at DEF CON, over three-fourths of them are still working for the Air Force. Now, they have tongue studs and earrings, so they're civilians, but they're making a contribution. <laughs> and just as my former boss said yesterday, I, I retired from NSA in December after having been there for a number of years, what you are doing is critically important. The message that the press needs to put out is that you are making a valuable contribution to our economy and to our way of life. And this is not a nationalistic sentiment. This is a worldwide issue. We're all over the world with this, and we all need to work together to address this problem. Third point, and then I'll shut up. <coughs> Cyber education, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math does not get enough attention in this country. We provide sports scholarships for people who go into the professional sports and have a shelf life of five or seven years. I think we'd get a better return on our investment if we do scholarships for people in STEM. Yeah. At our major universities and colleges, over half of the, po the postgraduate, the, the master's degree and PhD students are not U.S. citizens. They graduate, and under our current immigration policies, they have to go home. They go home and create jobs and develop technology that we, in turn, buy. I call that reverse colonialism. I'm a strong advocate of stapling a green card to every one of their diplomas to keep them here. Okay, um, I'm Jim Christie. Are, are you done yet down there? Okay. I'm, I'm done. Okay. Uh, I'm with the Department of Defense Cyber Crime Center. Talk a little bit about what they do. Uh, we have the world's largest accredited digital forensics lab. We have over 100 digital forensic examiners. Uh, we're accredited by the American Society of Crime Lab Directors Laboratory Accreditation Board, ASCLAD Lab. That's hard to say. Um, we have a uh, training academy and we train all the criminal and counterintelligence investigators in the Department of Defense on how to do, how to conduct a cybercrime investigation and how to do digital forensics. Uh, and then there's other portions of uh, uh, DC3. But one of the, to piggyback off what Rich was just talking about, about STEM, um, we get folks coming to DC3 to be d uh, digital forensic examiners and they may have a degree uh, in digital forensics and they can't meet our standards. So what we've done is we've created a STEM program called uh, the uh, Center for Digital Forensics Academic Excellence. And we are partnering with multiple two and four year and graduate level universities to create standards for digital forensics and certify not only the program of the school but also certify the uh, uh, individual students so that uh, we can produce uh, quality folks out there and you're not buying a pig and a poke either as a private sector or uh, a law enforcement agency. Uh, a lot of you, I've, I've seen a, several of you have come up and talked to me uh, this past week on our challenge. We run the DC3 Digital Forensics Challenge. We have about 900 teams from 51 countries currently participating. I would, I would encourage you to go to our website, dc3.mil, check out our challenge. And, uh, and if you have kids, since, since all of you have grown up here over the last 20 years and have kids now, get your kids involved in digital forensics for us because we really need uh, 
uh, uh, quality people coming through. Uh, another thing that we have going for DEF CON kids, uh, we're, we've, we brought in, uh, our team from DC3 brought in three digital crime scenes. So Nico did a terrific job with the hotel and we have three suites upstairs and we have a digital crime scene each one and so the kids, the DEF CON kids are being scheduled and they have a half hour to do a search of these crime scenes. So if you're interested and you have kids that are here, you know, please sign up for that. One of the other things we have is an online, uh, uh, an assessment on uh, digital forensics and cyber crime investigations that's called CSI Cyber. You go to our website and, and we'll give you a link. So uh, with that, what we're going to do is now open it up to questions and you're up first. Well, actually, I had two questions, but if you're signed uh, your... One is yeah, I know, but since you ch signed your contract, then I know I think Duff Ducky's going to live. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have seven grandchildren and they all need educating. <laughs> okay. Well, here's, here's my question. Um, you know how this is long ago before we actually had networking, communities used to uh, try to uh, do things to save the communities, such as like in Mykonos, they'd change their streets around so that the pirates couldn't attack them. And now that we're in networking, uh, it seems as though you know, the Army and all the other organizations, they have their own force. Each DOOM controls that. And um, like just recently, about a year ago, one of the uh, Army bases got hacked into and it made the news. Which one? Well, a couple. <laughs> but anyway, this, the, the new thing that's going on is they want to take all these forests and collapse them down to one big forest. And when I look at this, I just see it's a better way to get into everything. And I wanted to know what your opinion was regarding collapsing the force. I, I don't see much yeah, for security. No, I, uh, I personally think um, that building one single castle is a bad idea. I think it's bad strategy. I think the future of security is a decentralized, dispersed, and otherwise uh, at times seemingly innocent looking colonies of data. I think uh, if we centralize, we look forward to and welcome extinction because we just kind of, uh, it's bad planning. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to add to your point, I think your observation is spot on. This domain is man-made, okay? That means the preponderance of intellectual capital resides out there, folks like yourself, the various ecosystems globally. We need to figure out as a means in which we are able to grasp into those various communities in real time. Okay, so I think you're spot on. I mean, we talk about the mix. Okay, the challenge here is the mix is made up of people like yourselves, the patriots, the wizards, etc., that have insight and knowledge that we need to leverage. The key is how do we do that? So I think you make a really good point. Let me uh, just kind of add a, an observation. Lawyers are peculiar in the way they think. They think about analogies. And when we look at the internet today and what it does in terms of information sharing and communication, I look back and I wasn't present at the time, but I compare it in many respects to the Roman roads that were used for logistical purposes and communication purposes. It went from Rome all the way up to the Hadrian Wall and just south of the border of Scotland. I also look at the Silk Road. The Silk Road was not a paved path. It was a series of points and you had to know who to talk to to get from A to B to C to D and E, et cetera. And I'm drawing all of this from Marco Polo's uh, autobiography. The Silk Road was security by obscurity. It worked. The Roman Roads was an open system. And as long as the Romans had collaboration with their neighbors to protect that pathway, they were safe. But when they did not work together to keep that protected, then the Goths, the Vandals, and the other gangs <laughs> from us, Europe came down and massive disruption of Rome. And I realize that's a very strong simplification. But as we move through this domain, as my colleague mentioned, we need to work in a collaborative way 
to help keep it safe and secure and useful for all of us. Thanks, next question. Speak right into the microphone because I could hardly hear her questions. All righty, sir. Yep. I'm an investigator down at Fort Hood and I was wondering if, to the other investigative agencies, if you all are seeing a prevalence or a rise in incident in child pornography and if so, is that because of the utilization or is that just because of the thoroughness in your investigative techniques? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I, I think that child pornography is probably the number one cyber crime everywhere in the world. Uh, I think the uh, computers enable, the, the technology enables the crime. You know, way back in the old days, you know, 20 years ago, if you wanted to do child pornography, you had to have a, your own photo lab. You know, you couldn't send it to Rite Aid for development, you know, so you had to produce it yourself and then distribute it by mail. So U.S. Customs and U.S. Postal Service were the ones that were involved in the interdiction of child pornography. Today, there is not a single person in this room that doesn't have the ability to produce and distribute worldwide child pornography. And unfortunately, it is a plague that, that every law enforcement agency in the world has to deal with. Um, so uh, anything we can do to put these guys away, you know, if you see something, say something, notify the cops, you know, we, we, you know but it is a plague. Uh, yeah, actually, so let me it, add yeah, that so uh, the laws against child pornography actually make it much more prevalent in some ways. And that sounds like a stupid thing to say, but the reality is that if you have possession of any kind of pictures, you're subject to arrest. The problem is that there was no real exemptions given other than for the Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So if an, somebody complains to an ISP that they've come across an email that points them to a pornographic site, the ISP is not going to go to that site to see because the mere clicking of that link puts the copy on their machine and would subject them to arrest. In reality, what happens is there's an awful lot of private trust groups, I guess for lack of a better term, that operate on the internet that constantly feed different people, including federal agencies and other government agencies, information. And even in those groups, they will not click on links if somebody suspects child porn. In one case, uh, I have a, a spam trap set up that I get about 10 to 15 million emails a day on. And I have all sorts of regexes and, and heuristics that I use to look for stuff. I will not look for child porn because I am not going to click on it and find out, whoops, it is. So unfortunately, the way they've done the law is made it much more difficult to detect because nobody wants to check to see if it's there. Kind of like a catch-22. Okay, yeah, but, sometimes we get leads from ICE, so they'll say, hey. Sorry, what? Sometimes we will get leads from ICE. They'll come and say, hey, we, in this area we have these individuals and then we'll do a joint. Well, there's a lot of child pornography out there. Uh, there's some <laughs> fake child pornography, but it's been a problem, it will continue to be a problem. And it's made, it's exasperated by the fact that the people that are out there that are monitoring for things will refuse to even look for it to try and refer it to, to other people. Okay, all right, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. About 13 years ago, I worked for a software company that provided a database that tracked gang members in California. And this was a non-prosecutorial database, meaning you couldn't use it in a prosecution against somebody, but you could use it to track somebody or investigate somebody. And these databases are growing and growing, and you know, it's gangs, or it's this, or it's that. And it's more guilty till proven innocent. My question is, what are your thoughts on this, and is it valuable to you as officers, or do you see it as an invasion of privacy? Be honest, it's all right. It's tough because if you look at this and you think about this, think about it in your mind when you answer the question, these are 13-year-old kids, most of them are minorities who are in this database, and they've done nothing wrong, right? So. Well, having been out, been out of the system for about 10 years, I can tell you going back and being in LA, which at that time was probably one of the, they were the largest, largest gang, right? gang activity in the world, the databases do help. The officers on the street 
do get that information. But you're right, sometimes innocent young kids get caught up in that because of their association, so it becomes guilt by association. But I think long term it's good to have bases. We just have to be careful that we don't uh, give that moniker to young kids that carry on with them later in life. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you all, gentlemen, for taking the time to be here today and speak with us. Hopefully next year, maybe some lady feds as well, as we have more girls in the audience. They're on the next panel. Relax. Perfect. I'll be here to see them as well. So I'll keep the question short and sweet, mostly to Rich from the NSA, but I'm happy to hear all of your um, experienced thoughts about this. You mentioned that an eligible receiver, you spent a lot of time doing reconnaissance. There was also a DARPA research about red team activity uh, back from the 90s that s showed that 80% of their time, or the attacker's time, was spent on reconnaissance and intelligence gathering about the attack, not just. The, the actual attack time was 5% of the whole thing. Do you think in this day and age, is that still relevant or is the exposed electronic um, attack surface made the whole reconnaissance and intelligence gathering stages much easier for the attackers? Thank you. Wow. Um, things have changed a lot. You know, the, the understanding level uh, has changed significantly in terms of that issue. Let me give you an example. A year after we did, conducted the exercise, um, we were given permission to brief the National Security Law Division of the American Bar Association in Washington, D.C. And it took place the day after um, Galaxy 4 went off station. Now, satellites, as you know, are geocentrinous but they kind of wobble around like a bumblebee coming in for a landing. They, they just don't stay stuck. The satellite got off track just a bit. And so that particular afternoon and evening, no one could use their credit cards because the credit card information was bounced off the satellite to a processing center in St. Louis at that particular time. You could not also use what we call pagers. You'll have to probably Google that. <laughs> I, I heard about those. Yeah, no, we, a museum, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm giving the present, you just before I'm giving the presentation, you know, you do the socialization bit with these uh, senior lawyers. And everyone was complaining about the fact that they couldn't use their credit card the night before. And uh, NPR, which is always accurate with the news, as you know, <laughs> commented that the satellite had gone off site and that was the problem. The general counsel for the company that owned Galaxy was there and he said, and listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you, he said, it did not happen, it was not Galaxy's fault, because if there had been an issue, he would have been paged. <laughs> We don't have that issue today. You know, people are becoming more and more educated, whether they, by immersion, associated with the internet and computers. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. It does open the door to a broader attack service. But because we're smarter, we should be able to handle that. We should always be ahead of the bad guys and girls, because we're smarter. And I truly believe that. And I hope that answers your question. I have a hard time hearing sometimes. I'm an old guy. Uh, so I hope I answered your question correctly. Well, uh, partially, but I'm going to let these guys ask their questions too. So thanks a lot. Um. Yeah, could you speak up really loud because we really are having trouble understanding the questions up here. Acceptable? Yes, thank you. <laughs> so um, generally federal agencies are staffed by well-intentioned individuals. And so I was wondering to what extent uh, 
programs that this audience finds alarming are considered problems within those agencies, and uh, if so, what actions are taken to fix them? Well, we didn't track anybody at the IRS. I couldn't answer that. <laughs> Let, let me let me let me answer that with a somewhat political answer, and I'm not a politically correct person by any means. But in the federal government, anytime you tr you store data, it becomes what's referred to as a system of records. And in order to develop that system of records, you have to get approvals like way up the chain. So ad hoc databases of that kind of information, whether it be personal information or gang information or whatever never will exist in the federal government, at least in the civilian side, without a uh, system of records being advertised, you know, publicly. So the data that is stored is generally clear data. It's published what it's used for, how it's to be used, and who has it where it's stored. So you don't have these under the table ad hoc type databases sitting around. And in order to generate or to justify any system of records, you have to talk to people up upstream of you and justify you know, how long you're going to have the data, how you're going to purge the data, who's going to have access to the data, what kind of FOIA requests can be answered from the data, and whether or not it's, it's going to be permitted for any kind of like, prosecution type stuff. So it just doesn't happen out of the clear blue sky. And, and how about DHS? I, I didn't work for DHS, so I can't answer. No, that's, not a, that's an org chart, so that's a problem there. Um, with regard to your comment, if you look at the military agencies, this is something, as a retired military officer myself, I mean, we've got the best world-class, best fighting force in the free world. We're so regimented, think about that, so regimented and therefore predictable that my challenge there, that could be our nemesis, especially within the cyber domain. Riley, I'd like to jump in on that. One of the biggest areas that really shook the bureaucracy and, and really rattled the, the lattice work of plumbing in, inside the bureaucracy with regards to data was the Arab Spring in social media. Um, there's, there's continued ongoing debates about Facebook and Twitter and what is public and what is private and what does this all mean. Uh, at the end of the day though, you take an, an, an online environment like YouTube that is in many cases changing people's lives, whether you're a potato farmer in soy Kenya that's able to find out that sprinkling ash on your crops saves you and your family money and lives, or you're using YouTube to learn about America or some other country, or et cetera. So where does the social media data fit into the existing lexicon? And I'll tell you, um, the government just by nature defaults to we need to really look at this for the purposes of privacy. I and mean, that is the number one gateway discussion before any of this is taken into consideration. So right now, I would say there's a, there's a continuing discussion, and I haven't seen any verifiable resolve unless you guys have, uh, where how do they fit this into the framework of, of government data of, for the good of saving people, for, for the good of uh, understanding if there's a disaster or some of the other nefarious objectives. So it is, it is something that is forever changing and, um, and it's the nature of the bureaucracy to default on the side of protecting the people's privacy. Let, let me also add that all of the really good data isn't being stored by the government, maybe with, that, with the exception of NSA because I don't know what they have. But when it comes to a lot of the information that's on the internet, there are private companies that make their living getting, collating, collecting, and analyzing that data. And it's very easy for somebody, like when I was an investigator, if I had a problem, I could send the note out to a certain mailing list and say, hey, does anybody have any information on this IP address? And I'd have 20 investigators or researchers coming back saying, well, on so-and-so date, we saw that address, you know, accessing Tor, and we saw this address being used to, to spend out cut wheel mail and, and everything else. Um, probably one of the funniest stories I had to tell is that very, very early on, IRS was one of the very first government agencies to actually get targeted by phishing sites, uh, phishing schemes. And we had one that was in Japan. I just couldn't call anybody and get it taken down. So I put a note out on one of these security lists that I was on, one of these secret squirrel-type lists 
that you know only people that know each other get on to. And I said, I'm having a problem with this ISP in Japan. You know, does anybody uh, have the ability to take this site down? And I got a note back about five minutes later. I says, hey, yeah, no problem. I took it down. So I wrote back to him and said, you know, any chance you can get me the logs from that? Because I'd really like to see, you know, where the F FTP logs were sent up uh, to see maybe where we can tra track back the phishing site, the actual source. And he wrote back about 20 minutes later and said, yeah, no problem. Here's the logs. Here's the, the data. Let me know if you need anything else. I wrote back, I said, thanks, are you the system administrator? The guy wrote back and just said, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> Let me add. I know nothing. <laughs> Let me add one brief twist to your question. I share your fear about those who collect information. But I don't fear the government. I fear the private sector. There is so much oversight properly so on the government. And in the United States, you're protected. You've got constitutional protections. And people who violate that in the government are punished. You do not have that constitutional protection from the private sector. And I'm not going to mention any of their names other than the ones I've mentioned already. But there's they're the ones you have to watch for. There's something I learned very early in my career. Anytime the government tells you you should do this because it's good for you, they're lying. I personally trust the government less than I do private industry, having been there for 20 years. <laughs> okay, on that note. <laughs> <laughs>